So I mentioned that chemotherapy has not really shown to be tremendously effective in this disease. Um, at least traditionally, uh, single agent chemotherapy has not really shown good response. Uh, a number of phase one and phase two trials have been done over the last couple of decades. And we can see that, that response rates, and we're talking about response rates now, not cures, okay? So we're talking about the number of patients, the percentage of patients who we see a radiographic response uh, to treatment varies between three and maybe 20 percent, not great. A recent randomized study, however, showed that the combination of, of a platinum-based agent with a new drug called pemetrexid, or Alimta, that many of you have, have probably heard of or are already on, actually showed improvement in survival over single agent platinum. Now, the difference was not huge, but it was a, a, a prolongation of, a, of, of on average, uh, three months over just single agent chemotherapy. The 40 percent of patients had some response with this form of chemotherapy. Again, we're not talking about a 40 percent cure rate. In fact, the cure rate is probably close to zero with just chemotherapy. It isn't zero, but it's close to it. Uh, we're talking about 40 percent of people who got that drug combination, the Olympta and the cisplatin, actually had a visible reduction in the size of their tumor. A similar study using a, a, an Olympta relative called Ralitrex that was performed in Europe recently and showed a similar prolongation of survival, a median, of, uh, a median improvement of survival of about three months. So at least now we, we know that we have better acting chemotherapy drugs, far from a home run though. And then there's this troublesome study, which just came out in The Lancet last year. Um, this was from Britain. And only in Britain, I think, in a nationalized health service could you get away with this. But they, they took a bunch of patients who had, were diagnosed with mesothelioma, and they performed active symptom control, which basically means palliative care, no chemotherapy, on one, one group, and active symptom control with chemotherapy on another group and found no significant difference in survival. That's all I'm going to say about chemotherapy. So what are the surgical options for this disease? Well, surgery has a role in the diagnosis of mesothelioma. It has a, a, a role in the symptom control of mesothelioma as well. Oftentimes we can perform removal of fluid from the chest, we can put in talc, we can put drains in to drain that fluid out so that patients can breathe a little bit better. I'm not really going to talk too much about those. I really want to concentrate on cytoreductive surgery. And by cytoreductive surgery, as I said before, we mean debulking of the tumor or removing as much tumor out of the chest as you possibly can. And there are two forms of debulking surgery. There's a, large, there's a, a larger form called extrapleural pneumonectomy, which is a more radical operation that, that removes the entire affected lung as well as the pleura and, and the diaphragm and the pericardium. And there's a less radical uh, procedure that basically just aims at peeling the tumor off of the lung and the chest wall called pleurectomy decortication. I think it's important when one considers cytoreductive surgery, um, when one's talking to, to a patient about this, that we consider the following factors. Any cytoreductive surgery, in my opinion, ought to attempt to, to provide a complete removal of all macroscopic tumor. So any gross tumor, any obvious tumor that we can see or feel should, uh, the removal of that from the chest should be the goal of the surgery. It is also important to consider whether or not one has additional things that one can treat patients with after surgery. For instance, after an extrapleural pneumonectomy, the lung is not in, in place anymore, which means that after I take the lung out, we can really give high-dose radiation to patients. Um, however, if I do a pleurectomy or a peeling type operation, because the lung still stays in place, very, very hard to give effective, meaningful radiation. And the other thing we have to look at, of course, is, is the patient themselves, what their performance status is. A patient who is 70 years old or older is, is unlikely to do very well with an extra pleural pneumonectomy, purely because it's a bigger operation, the patient's older and less able to tolerate it. Things like histology are really important. I don't personally operate on patients who have sarcomatoid tumors anymore because I know from our experience that, that it doesn't do them any good. And stage is something that we're going to talk, to, talk uh, about in a moment. 
staging of mesothelioma is important. We do not want to be operating on patients who have very advanced stage tumors, particularly tumors that have spread across the diaphragm and have invaded the abdominal cavity, or tumors that have spread to other organs. So in terms of preoperative uh, assessment, we try as best we can to try and figure out the stage of the patient before we, we recommend a course of therapy. And this has been complicated, as I've, as I've said before, by a, a whole plethora of different staging systems. Currently, the one that we use and that 90 percent of people use, thankfully, is the um, International Mesothelioma Interest Group, or, or AJCC, staging system. And a group was just met in London earlier this year, and there's going to be, we're, we're designing a newer version of this. Uh, the last one was sort of designed uh, last, uh, in the last decade. So there's going to be an update coming out probably in the next two years. And I want to just run through this. Basically, that is a, a cartoon to illustrate the, a patient's chest without any mesothelioma. Where this mesothelioma typically starts and is in its earliest form is on the parietal pleural lining. Okay? Uh, so there's those white little nodules there. As the tumor spreads, it'll start coating the, the surface of the lung. We have visceral pleural involvement at that point. The tumor then can start growing actually into the lung tissue itself, such as there. Or it can completely form this rind, this thick peel of tumor around the lung. It can also start invading the muscle that separates the chest from the abdominal cavity, the diaphragm. Here you can see some diaphragmatic invasion. This is the diaphragm here on the left side of the screen and there's tumor invading into it. Pericardial invasion. The, the pericardium is just a fibrous sac that the heart sits in, but when, that, uh, when the tumor is extensive, it starts to involve that pericardium. It can also start involving the chest wall. And when, we, when, when patients come to my office and they start complaining of, of chest wall pain or tenderness, unless it's due to a surgical procedure that had been done, it's, it's a sign oftentimes that the tumor has actually started to invade the chest wall. Now, a single focus of invasion of the chest wall is still something that we would consider operating on, but when there are multiple foci of invasion, then that's usually not something that surgery is effective with. This is something that's incredibly difficult to diagnose. This represents a patient who had transmural pericardial invasion. That just means that the tumor not only invaded the pericardium, but actually eroded through it. That is not something that we can pick up easily on CT scans or anything before surgery, unfortunately. And then, as I mentioned, as, as these tumors grow, they tend to invade the diaphragm. And if they keep on going, they can actually invade into the abdominal cavity. And here you can see, if, uh, on the, just above the liver here, you can see invasion through the diaphragm. Again, not something that we can, that we can typically operate on. This is a, a laparoscopic image of a person who had transdiaphragmatic invasion. Now, you'll note that these are, are pretty small nodules. Each of them is about maybe five millimeters or so in size. That is not something that we have a good way of detecting by means of CAT scans or MRIs or PET scans. The, the, we don't have high enough resolution. And really, the only foolproof way of detecting that is to do something called laparoscopy, where we do a small minor surgical procedure and we put a scope inside the abdominal cavity. And we actually take a look directly at the underside of the diaphragm to make sure there's no tumor there.